as a member of the opposition in Sri Lanka, I am grateful to the government of Sri Lanka for inviting me to address today, today's session of empowering marginalized youth. As you know, marginalization is, is a topic that has been talked about around the world. Uh, marginalization uh, is a kind of it's an exclusion or isolation of the young people from the main political, social, and economic mainstreams. Uh, youth marginalization also can be divided as the economic marginalization, social marginalization, and of course, political marginalization. Commonly marginalized groups of young people often include young women, girls, rural youth, youth with different social uh, and health conditions, and indigenous and pastoral youth. The WHO defines most at-risk population as men who have sex with men, transgender people, people who inject drugs, and people who do sex work. <clears throat> most at-risk populations are disproportionately affected by HIV in most, if not all, epidemic contexts. These WHO guidelines define key populations to include both vulnerable and most at-risk populations. They are important to the dynamic of HIV transmission in a given setting and are essential partners in an effective response to the epidemic. People living with HIV are considered a key population in all epidemic contexts. According to estimates, young people aged between 15 and 24 represent 45% of all new HIV infections globally. And in Asia, over 95% of these new infections occur among young people in key affected populations. Widespread stigma and discrimination against people who do sex work, men engaging in male-to-male -male sex, transgender people, and people who use drugs limit their access to HIV prevention. Discrimination also limits the access many young people have to sexual and reproductive health products and services. Many countries require parental consent before young people can receive HIV tests, or where there are legal harm reduction services such as sterile needles and syringes. And young people often face breaches of confidentiality when accessing these services. According to the Global Commission on HIV and the law, 90% of the countries in the Asian Pacific still have laws that act as barriers to HIV response. For example, 16 Asia Pacific countries have imposed travel bans to people living with HIV. 19 countries imprison individuals engaging in same-sex relations. And 29 countries criminalize sex workers. In Sri Lanka, a recent study on media coverage of key populations done by the UNDP states that almost half the coverage, that is 46% of media coverage, presented male-to-male -male sex and transgender as immoral. And while female sex workers were primarily positioned both as criminals and victims, coverage of people who use drugs who account for the maximum coverage was overwhelmingly that of criminals, while data of people with HIV fell mostly in the positive category. However, close examination indicates that much of it was event centric coverage such as World AIDS Day, rather than a positive depiction of people with HIV as confronting and overcoming challenge, uh, everyday challenges. About 27% of the coverage of people with HIV positioned them as victims, doomed to die tragic deaths, with little agents to alter their destinies. Media coverage is a reflection of the perception of the society and at the same time it shapes the perception of society. This kind of criminalization leads to society either shunning or victimizing these youth. There have been reports of heroin addicts who have been placed in mental institutions and been abandoned by their families. So as recommendations for empowering marginalized youth, including most at risk youth, we do need to have a comprehensive sexuality education. A CSC provides comprehensive and accurate information, encouraging young people to start thinking critically and communicate with trusted adults on such issues. CSC encourages safe sexual practices and also early health-seeking behaviors 
which is vital for prevention of HIV and STDs. Ideally, sex education in school is an integrated process that builds upon itself year after year, is initiated in kindergarten, and, to, and is provided up till grade 12. Advocates for youth organization states, evaluations of a comprehensive sex education program shows that these programs can help youth delay onset sexual activity, reduce the frequency of sexual activity, reduce number of sexual partners, and increase condom and contraceptive use. There has to be advocacy. There has to be sensitization of legislators, parliamentarians, judiciary, and law enforcement agencies to work towards replacing the current punitive laws, policies, and practices with more rights-based approaches. There has to be enhanced capacity of health systems to respond to health concern of same-sex and transgender people, the need for expanding coverage to deliver HIV prevention, treatment, care, and allied health services. And then the media, the, the engaging with public media to ensure more balanced and respectful portrayal of HIV, same-sex relations, and transgender issues result in a reduction of stigma and discrimination working to ensure that relevant health information for same-sex relations and transgender people can be publicized. As a working politi politician representing the youth wing of my political party, in addition to my task of representing my constituency, I wish to cover some of the real problems that I encounter in my daily work as it relates to marginalized young people, which I believe is no different in many countries around the world. I come up across marginalized youth, both male and female, who are migrants from economically poor, poorer regions of our country, who come to my constituency in search of work and thus have to live away from home, often under harsh conditions, in boarding houses, sharing rooms with many others from other parts. There are many who are single-minded and focused and arrive with the discipline not to get into trouble and are able to save and return home once they are able to satisfy their personal objectives. However, not everyone is so fortunate to have that comfort as they face problems in their home villages that result in their having to come to places where there is employment in order to live and are not armed with the same level of maturity. They who are of lesser strength of character have to protect themselves from the social ills of the day, especially in urban areas where the layer of temptations often exceed the funds available to fulfill them. This leads to pressure to get into illegal activity with promises made by unscrupulous opportunities who prey on their mental weaknesses and inevitably get them into trouble. This may be prostitution, drug distribution and addiction and getting involved with the wrong people completely unaware of their ulterior motives. This results in them having to face problems that they cannot resolve by returning to their homes, which then lead to a life of misery being shoved from pillar to post. This issue of migrant youth who come from rural areas to urban centers is not particular, uh, peculiar to Sri Lanka, but is prevalent all, all throughout the world. When they are marginalized in their host communities as they have no fallback, it is important that social and state services are provided to give them some degree of comfort and security to address their plight so that they do not add to the already bursting prison populations where they end up in worse situations, making criminals out of previously law-abiding young people. The alternative is to go underground and get into cliques and become part of the underworld, subculture seeking solace in the gang culture, turning them into a life of crime. It is therefore important that the Colombo Declaration of Youth to be issued at the conclusion of this conference be specific enough to demand that these youth, who due to their lack of permanent abodes, who also do not become part of the electoral process in their host communities, and therefore are of no concern to the local politicians that can address their grievances, have a method of being empowered to face these challenges and overcome the obstacles. This is why special attention to include both the rights of the disabled youth and migrant youth issues in any youth-related empowerment program is essential. If not, society will pay the price of this neglect in the form of high expenditure in future on crime prevention, on incarceration, 
medical services and psychological services in helping them survive. Instead, and on the other hand, if the declaration is enacted by members, member states, they will be part of the economic fabric of their societies, contributing their fair share to the upliftment of the communities they happen to live in. I know I selected just one aspect of the marginalized, and I know there are many that you have been represented, presented with in this forum. However, identifying what they are and proposing and enacting a practical solution is what is needed and quite possible if there is sufficient emphasis placed. In this respect, as a lawmaker in my own country, I personally pledge to support this initiative with all the resources at my disposal and wish that you can take back a similar pledge to your countries and pressure your lawmakers to do likewise. It is very important that we make sure that this conference results in positive change for the betterment of the youth in all their differences and complexities. Only then can we hold our heads up high and tell others that we were truly participants in an international effort that actually worked and not merely words of platitude.